Frictional games have had an interesting history when it comes to horror games. I mean, they arguably helped to popularize first-person horror with the Penumbra series, and then more or less cemented it years later with Amnesia The Dark Descent. <laughs> From there, they took an interesting turn though with the highly narrative-driven Soma, a game which I've since really come to appreciate. But their Amnesia series has sort of been up in the air since that first entry. A Machine for Pigs, for instance, was made by a completely different developer, removing most of the survival mechanics completely, and then Amnesia Rebirth was more or less just a walking simulator and not a very good one either. It had definitely strayed a fair bit from those nightmare-inducing sequences in The Dark Descent, and it's a good example of a series at its absolute lowest point. But that's all about to change with the latest entry in the series, Amnesia the Bunker, which in a lot of ways is the most survival horror title they've made yet, not to mention a fantastic return to form. If you were worried about this thing being yet another walking sim or not having enough gameplay, well, worry not, because that couldn't be further from the truth. And it's one of the better horror games we've had in recent memory, which is really saying a lot. The bunker isn't just terrifying due to its theme and premise, but also because it is absolutely relentless at times by design. This is a crushing game that constantly encourages you to try different tactics and change the way you approach things, and if you aren't willing to adapt, well, you're gonna fail time and time again. <laughs> It's almost got a bit of an immersive sim vibe in that way, in the sense that it really lets you choose your own approach to each obstacle, with this really interesting backdrop of this desecrated bunker. We just really don't get enough World War One themed horror games, and about all that comes to mind there are those nightmare sequences in the darkness, you've got the Necrovision series, and also the upcoming Conscript, an isometric shooter coming out god knows when. So there's definitely something unique just about the premise to begin with. Even that opening sequence is horrifying enough, dropping you right into trench warfare in the middle of Europe as a French soldier fighting back against the Germans. You're playing as a guy named Henry, and along with your buddy Lambert, trying to make a desperate run back to the safety of the bunker. At one point, even catching a mustard gas grenade with your face. Tommy! Where are you? Yeah, and if you ever wanted to see what true horror looks like, well, go into Google Images and look at the results that Mustard Gas had on those soldiers back then. Anyway, during this prologue, Lambert is sadly killed, Henry is seriously wounded and passes out, waking up later in the eponymous bunker to find the entire place empty, torn apart and the power out. You soon come across a lone survivor, a fellow soldier who's on death's door, who basically asks to be put out of his misery. So your first task in the game is to find a service revolver and be the angel of death to this poor bastard. Here, take this. Finish me off, please. Only, before you get the chance, someone else does the job for you. For you. Only, before you even get the chance to, someone else does the job. From this point on, things become pretty hardcore, almost kind of like surprisingly so, because now you're constantly being hunted and attacked at random by this monster, which is always lurking somewhere off in the distance. And it's this sense of dread that doesn't really ever go away until you reach those end credits. <laughs> I'm in danger! As you try to find the means to escape, you'll also uncover a bit of the backstory as to what happened while you're off getting your beauty sleep, as well as unearthing clues as to the origin of what the monster is. The bunker runs on Frictional Games' in-house engine, the HPL engine, which they've been using as far back as even the first Penumbra game. And yeah, it does kind of show its age in a couple of ways, mostly in just how some of the character models look but the lighting effects are still really impressive and they really managed to capture the dirt and grunge that you'd really expect from being trapped in a dust-filled bunker in the early 20th century. And you can't fault this series for at least keeping things visually varied. I mean, from spooky European castles in the Dark Descent, oil and muck-stained factories in a machine for pigs, now through to an eerie, empty bunker. I mean, it's a vibe. A depressing vibe, but yeah, it's a vibe all the same. If indie games have taught me anything though, it's that graphics don't really matter when it comes to the horror aspect, and that's something that the bunker is definitely not lacking. In fact, the only moment of levity I think there is in the entire game was seeing a bunch of giant rats eating a block of cheese in the pantry. <laughs> Alright, I gotta admit that that's pretty funny. Other than that though, this is a game that's gonna have your stomach in knots for those 5 or 6 hours that it takes to beat. That's a good thing. The bunker's also unique for the series in that it's the first game to actually let you defend yourself with a weapon, compared to the other games where if you were detected by an enemy you were often just 
dead. And I'm just kind of hoping that we're finally seeing the end of these horror games that force you to run away from everything the entire time. Your main weapon is that service revolver, which does pack a bit of a punch, but you'll only find a couple of bullets for it at any one time. And I think in the entire game, there can't be more than a dozen spare bullets all up. I don't think I've ever looked in this drawer. <laughs> wow, a gun! <laughs> Later on you'll also get a shotgun, but I was only able to find about three shells for that thing in total as well. And reloading both of these is slow and methodical, again by design, which means that they're really just meant as a last resort if running away just isn't an option. Grenades and molotovs are also useful options, they're just a bit tricky to use under pressure, but they're definitely a better alternative to having your skull crushed in by this otherworldly creature. I do think the absence of a rifle is a little bit weird, especially considering how rifles are almost a bit of a staple of survival horror as well. Not to mention, half of World War I was fought with bolt-action rifles, and I'd imagine that having to manually load in a single round would also make for some tense gameplay. Speaking of staples of survival horror, saves in this thing are manual only. Yeah, no checkpoints or auto-saves. In fact, there's only one main save point in the entire game in a central area with an always working light source, which is also where you'll find that very Resident Evil inspired item box. Not to mention, this is one of the only areas in the game you can barricade so the monster can't get in. You know, assuming of course you remember to lock the door. Hey, young man, you got knocked the fuck out. It might piss off a few people that saving is so limited, but I think they've done this on purpose so an autosave or a checkpoint doesn't screw you over and leave you in a really shitty place. I mean, if you think about it, it could be really easy to accidentally put yourself in a really crappy situation, like if you wasted too much ammo or other important resources, and then had that bad choice cemented with an autosave. So it's actually kind of a relief to know that you've got the security of being able to retry something with that benefit of a hard save point. This area is also important because it's where the generator is kept, and you'll need to constantly keep this thing topped up with fuel, or else the power to the entire bunker goes out, at which point you'll be wandering around in the dark, and even locked off from accessing certain areas. I... guess no one's coming? This mechanic right here is also going to turn off a lot of people, I think, because you're constantly on the search for tins of fuel to keep this thing going. This means there's always this sense of urgency, and for someone like myself who's got borderline anxiety issues, well, you can imagine just how much this had me on edge. There's a stopwatch which is synced up to show you how much time is remaining, but ironically, I actually found this thing even worse because having it on me and checking it every couple of minutes made me even more anxious. Anyway, this main save room is more or less the hub of the bunker, and from there it splits off into the four or five different areas where your main objective is to find these components for the explosives. So you can destroy the rubble blocking the exit and then make your escape. To do this, you'll need to find a bunch of important items along the way, a lot of which are stashed away in lockers that have all got combination codes, like a wrench, a gas mask, a lighter, and what would any self-respecting survival horror game be without a pair of bolt cutters? How do you find the codes for all of these? Well, I'm so glad you asked. You find them scrawled on the back of the dozen or so dog tags left behind by your former allies. All of which are randomly generated by the way, and only after finding these can you then get into each individual locker. Thankfully too, whenever you find one of these codes, the game is even nice enough to jot them down in your journal, so you don't have to write them down or keep a mental note of which is which. And yes, I'm aware of the irony of bringing that up just after I made a video on System Shock. Some of these items are practically essential, like a lighter for instance might seem a bit innocuous, but you can't light Molotov cocktails or torches without them, so there's definitely motivation there to try and get access to all of these, so you can give yourself the best possible chance to survive. There's also these other components placed around the bunker at random for each playthrough, all of which have their own crafting uses. Like you can make molotovs by combining empty bottles, cloth, and fuel. You can make torches by combining cloth and sticks, and extra bandages by combining cloth and, well, cloth. Well, duh. So there's a fair bit of inventory management going on in here as well, because you can only hold a set amount of items, but also then only stash a set amount in that item box. Inventory upgrades give you an extra slot here and there, but you're still going to have to make that hard decision as to whether or not you actually need to hold on to something at any given time. And again, yes, I can see how that might kind of be annoying, but I mean, damn son, stuff like this is the hallmark of any good survival horror game. And I gotta say that I lapped all that shit up like it was cookie dough on the end of a mixing spoon. 
This is all, of course, while having to avoid gangs of giant rats who are up to no good and have started making trouble in the neighborhood, along with the random appearances of the monster itself because you never really know where or when this guy's gonna show up to say howdy. That's actually kind of part of what I really liked about the bunker, was how all of this stuff is constantly changing so you never get the same experience twice. Throughout each era, there's lots of traps like flares and grenade trip wires, which have been set up as the last bastion of defense by your now deceased allies. And these traps work both ways, so it's like you never know what the game's going to throw at you. Even the placement of items in those dog tag codes seems to change from playthrough to playthrough. Just means I can show footage of me picking up items and opening lockers without people bitching that I'm spoiling anything. Because the code that worked for me, it ain't necessarily going to work for you. The bunker's also got that whole condemn criminal origins thing going on where the only way to know how much ammo you've got left in a weapon is to check it physically. That means when you reload the revolver, Henry opens the chamber up and you can visually see how many rounds are left, manually loading them in one by one before shutting the chamber again. As for the shotgun, when you finally get it, there's only a handful of shells in the entire game, and only two of these can be loaded in at once. So, again, it's this purposefully slow process of loading the shells in manually to really emphasize just how important every shot is. Same thing with the healing, it's this very specific process where you wrap your wounds up in real time, which kind of reminds you how it's not the kind of thing you want to be doing under any kind of duress. Gotcha, bitch! There's no health bar or anything like that either. And about the only indication you get to your overall status is the amount of blood on your player's hand when you bring up the inventory, with, you know, more blood obviously being bad. Well, duh. And there's just something so cool about the animations across the board and how organic this all feels. From the simple actions of opening doors and cupboards through to looking down and seeing your own torso. And I think those inevitable VR mods we're going to get for this thing are going to make it feel even more immersive. Along with the mods that replace the monster with Shrek or Thomas the Tank Engine. <laughs> Speaking of Condemned, the whole monster thing reminds me of Condemned 2, specifically that one sequence where you had to escape from that rabid bear, only it's like they took that entire concept and dragged it out into an entire campaign. I'd also describe it as a combination of the tyrant in Resident Evil and then the alien in Alien Isolation, in the way that as soon as you're let loose in the bunker, every little thing you do has a chance of attracting the monster. You can do this by sprinting around too much, making a lot of racket moving around objects, or breaking down doors. And even your flashlight has a chance to attract it. Having a pull chain, you need to wind up every five seconds. Which in an empty bunker makes so much noise, you might as well be trying to pull start a fucking lawnmower. I had one point where I was running around and it grabbed me from one of its hidey holes. So I piss bolted all the way back to the save room and barely managed to lock the door in time. And yeah, it left me with some moist trousers. Let me put it that way. Fuck! But I learned after that what not to do. And you'll even notice too that it telegraphs when it's hanging around in certain areas. Which kind of harkens back to what I said earlier about how important it is to learn to adapt. Either way though, when it finds you, it pops out of a nearby hole in the wall and then starts investigating the nearby area, which is the point when you really want to make yourself inconspicuous. Because if you are detected, at best, all you can do is damage it enough that it gets wounded and retreats. It even does that thing where it barrels into you and knocks you on your ass as it's trying to get away, like the Xeno did in Alien Isolation. But also, much like the Xeno, this thing is always going to come back for more. And since you've only got like a finite amount of ammo and grenades, it becomes a bit of a race against your own resources to find your way out of the bunker before one ambush becomes too many to handle. And now remember that this is all affected by whether or not that generator is still running. Because whenever that monster is around, the nearby lights are going to flicker constantly, more or less letting you know that it's still in the area. And I don't know if it's intentional or not, but the flickering lights kind of give me some PTSD, thinking about the Shell Bridge Cradle puppets in Thief Deadly Shadows. <laughs> Regardless, it's also another really good reason to try to have the power going at all times, because it's a massive giveaway that this asshole is on the way before he's even shown up. And it again plays into that anxiety-inducing fuel management loop and the constant pressure of having to work with this ever-dwindling light source that adds a whole lot of tension to the gameplay. Now, personally, I never completely ran out of fuel here across two playthroughs, but I can see how if you piss fart around too much, this could definitely mess things up, to the point that you'd be spending a whole lot of time here wandering around in the dark. 
Unlike the other Amnesia games though, being in the dark doesn't affect your sanity meter or anything like that, which to be honest is kind of refreshing. Being in the dark just means that you're less likely to know when the monster is around and also have a harder time navigating the area because obviously you can barely see the ground in front of you. I can see! Now I usually play these kind of games like an absolute pussy. I mean, when I first played Alien Isolation for instance, I was more than happy to spend 99% of my time crouch walking around and trying to make myself as scarce as possible. So as a result, I probably didn't see the Xeno as much as other players would have. Same thing here with the bunker, I tried to like walk around most of the time to not make too much noise, and generally I just made sure that I was as quiet as possible, which meant that early on I just never saw the monster that much. When I started to live dangerously, almost on purpose, was when that thing really started to make its presence known, and the game became a lot more terrifying. I also like to live dangerously. What really sold me on the bunker though wasn't the monster because let's be honest, the premise of running away from some invincible killing machine has been done to death at this point and it really isn't that unique anymore. What really sold me though is the way they combine that with the open ended approach to puzzle solving and that right there is what makes this game so addicting. Because despite there being these very key items that you have to find, you can still explore the entire bunker in any order that you want to. If you come across a locked door, there's always multiple ways to approach it. You can simply find a way around, or you can break the door down with a brick. You can blow it up with an explosive barrel, or even just shoot it apart with a shotgun. Those gangs of hoodlum rats will often block off important areas, and you can scare these things off in a couple of different ways too. If you take too much damage and start bleeding, you'll even leave a blood trail, which the monster can use to track you. Come again? Yeah. Yikes. At one point you have to climb up into a pillbox and it's one of the few moments where you actually get to breathe fresh air. But if you linger here for too long, then a sniper off in the distance is going to start taking shots at you. In a really cool attention to detail too, you'll even notice how you hear the shot first and then it's not until like half a second later when it actually hits you. It's probably a good time to mention too just how good the sound design is, a lot of which gives you some helpful information like all the noises the monster makes when it's stomping around or skulking about in the walls. When you are detected, it plays a similar track from Amnesia the Dark Descent so you really know when you've been seen and can start making sure that all your affairs are in order. Want to hear the most annoying sound in the world? And when you fire a weapon or there's some kind of an explosion, you'll even have ringing in your ears for a few seconds to simulate the tinnitus. It's really just a bit of a masterclass in sound design and really shows you how important the audio is when creating this kind of frightening environment. It just makes it feel like this real and constantly harsh world where you never really get any kind of respite. And I think all of these small details are what makes the difference between a good game and a great one. And the most frightening thing is to think that while all of this is going on, there's still an entire war raging above you. In fact, there's even times when you'll hear the rumbling of nearby artillery strikes hitting the surface while you're moving around inside the bunker. So it's like while you're stuck in your own personal hell, there's still another one waiting for you outside. And yeah, let's just say too that the ending ain't exactly going to make you feel warm and fuzzy. Now I beat the game on normal mode for my first playthrough in about 6 hours, then I beat it again on hard mode in another 3. And as much as I did like it overall, there were a few things that I think are worth critiquing. For starters, the fact that the monster can kill you in a single hit, and this is stupid for two main reasons. Firstly, because one hit kills are just lame, especially on the default difficulty. I mean, why bother giving me health items in a healing system if the monster's gonna kill me in a single hit? <laughs> But secondly, because these one-hit kills have a preset animation where you get grabbed and killed in a very specific way, and if you're in a weird position when the monster grabs you, you'll end up seeing some janky shit. Like clipping through the walls, for instance, which ain't all that good for immersion. It's also a damn shame that the game just can't load up the entire bunker in one go either, and that jump between areas when you hit that loading screen is very noticeable, which, again, kind of ruins immersion. It is also completely fucking baffling why the frame rate cap is only 60. Now I don't know if this has been done for optimization reasons so it runs better on the consoles or what has exactly happened here. And yes I know that's kind of the norm for console players, lamau, but it's just so insane in this day and age for a PC title to be capped at 60. And despite what some people might like to tell themselves, there is a difference between playing a game at 60 compared to 144 or upwards. 
Overall, though, it seemed to run pretty smoothly, and I never had any crashes or serious bugs. But lousy PC ports are the kind of thing that fuel that review bombing fire. And I'd hate to see people writing this thing off because of that before they've even given the game a chance. Still, though, I think the bunker is absolutely worth playing, and an absolute must for not only fans of the series, but just horror fans in general. What Frictional Games have managed to do here is somehow take a premise that's already really been done to death and make it seem fresh and exciting. The short campaign length might turn off a few people, but I also think it has value in the replayability factor, if only just to beat it a second time to go for the alternate ending. It even has that quality of life inclusion of letting you skip over the prologue on replay so you can get right back into the action. The main menu also shows off the potential for modding support, and I hope in the future we'll get some awesome content coming out of the community as well. At the end of the day, the bunker achieved its intended goal of making me feel like a nervous piece of shit, along with making me scream so loudly at times that it caused my wife to come into the room and check on me out of concern. So for horror fans, I can't see any reason to not recommend it. And if this is the direction they'll be taking the Amnesia series from this point on, well, damn son, count me in. <laughs>